The birth of modern painting most likely took place in France in the second half of the 19th century and in the early 20th century, under the impetus of the modern era brought forth by the Industrial Revolution and the liberalization of customs. Behind the various labels, such as Impressionism led by Claude Monet, Pointillism by Paul Signac, Post-Impressionism by Vincent van Gogh, Fauvism by Henri Matisse, Cubism by Picasso, Surrealism by Salvador Dali, and Abstract Art by Fernand Léger, the artist became more than a witness. He became an actor, even a media of modern society. The works of these visionary painters who shaped the essence of modern painting are today among the most prized on the market. This documentary series presents an overview of the various instigators of these different movements. Post-Impressionism is an ensemble of artistic movements that diverged from the opposed Impressionism between 1885 and 1905. The term applies mainly to painters like Van Gogh, Seurat, Gauguin, and Toulouse-Lautrec. Though the style evolved, the essence of the Impressionist Revolution was not put into question, to transpose emotions visually, on a canvas, in utter freedom. During his adolescence, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec suddenly stopped growing due to a bone disease and to two horse riding accidents that left him deformed. He then began painting and drawing and later settled in Montmartre, Paris in 1882 to perfect his artistic skills. Toulouse-Lautrec immersed himself in Impressionism and became friends with Edgar Degas and Vincent van Gogh. A regular at the cabarets of Montmartre, he painted the theaters, cafes, concert halls and bordellos and illustrated his models on the spot. He depicted many artists and customers and thus immortalized them. Having become an emblematic figure of Paris's nightlife, a friend of the stars and night owls, alcoholism and syphilis overcame his fragile health at the age of 36. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was the promoter of a new aesthetics in portraiture. Toulouse-Lautrec owed his keen observation of the Paris nightlife and his interest for naturalist subjects to Degas. Maurice Joyon, who wrote the first biography on Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, noted that his friends enjoyed going to brothels. There he would find natural models who would move unfettered, naturally, not like studio models. We can see that in this painting, where Lautrec represented a young female prostitute putting on her stockings. Here we see the painter's affectionate attitude towards his model, a prostitute. He was also fascinated with redheads. We can see that in the beautiful head of hair he depicted here. The work is also very strikingly modern. Lautrec worked with the very edge of his paintbrush, creating very elegant brushstrokes that instantly summarized his subjects. He would also preserve the essential traits of his model, ignoring the rest, everything that was secondary, without detriment to the impact of his paintings. We can clearly see the gesture that this woman is making. She is attaching her stockings and yet, the painter did not depict her hands. We can also see the silhouette is well balanced. Through her lower legs are not depicted. The artwork is a non finito, which is a main trait of Toulouse-Lautrec's paintings. We can also note his systematic use of this technique. He would paint on a cardboard background, using fluid colors with the tip of his brush. 
The color pigment was mixed with terpathine, and since this binder is absorbed by the cardboard, only the pigment remained on the surface. For Toulouse-Lautrec, this technique enabled him to avoid dealing with backdrops, since the cardboard itself is colored. So he had no backdrop issues, since the medium itself is colored. What is striking is that emptiness plays a major part in this piece. It is built around both brushstrokes and emptiness. These two notions made up the artist's modern flair, the combination of non-finito and emptiness. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was born in Albi in 1864 in a highly aristocratic family of southwestern France. His hobbies included horseback riding, hunting, and also drawing, of course. As a young child, he would enjoy drawing with his father, the Count Alphonse de Toulouse-Lautrec, and early on he would decorate his school notebooks with washed-out portraits of his teachers. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec clearly had a very happy childhood. The stories of his two grandmothers are quite striking. They described him as a happy child, somewhat of a ringleader. He would lead his cousins along and he loved to draw. In the evening, he would take a piece of coal from the hearth to draw. During his childhood, he moved from estate to estate, spending his youthful years among the women of the family his mother, the countess, and his grandmothers. There were few men around him. Count Alphonse was rarely with him. Due to his passion for hunting, he would spend his time in other estates where he could hunt. However, he would sometimes see his father while in Paris. This is how he spent his childhood, in line with the customs of an aristocratic upbringing until his adolescent years. Then he suffered two accidents. He broke one leg, then the other. These fractures were the result of an illness that was unknown at the time. It was a matter of genetics. Count Alphonse de Toulouse-Lautrec and Countess Adèle were first cousins, and his illness was a result of inbreeding. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec thus suffered from a bone disease that erupted in his adolescence, and that left him confined to bed rest for many months. The fractures had to heal, and he suffered from the after-effects his entire life. He could no longer ride horses, nor could he enjoy outdoor activities like his father. He devoted himself to drawing, then to painting, and he painted horses, of course, as they were part of his family's legacy. Until the age of 10, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec had a happy childhood. He enjoyed horseback riding and painting lessons until the disease that affected his bone development manifested itself. His bones were fragile, and the multiple leg fractures he suffered prevented him from growing more than 1.5 meters. Beyond multiple hydrotherapeutic cures, attempts at healing him included electrical shocks and lead weights. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was born in one of the oldest families of France. In the 19th century, marriage among the nobility was commonly done between cousins so as to avoid dividing properties and losing assets. That was the case for Henri's parents. Alphonse de Toulouse-Lautrec and Adèle Tapier de Céléron were first-degree cousins. In his first paintings, created when he was only 15 years old, horses are a common motif. Having to give up horseback riding due to his illness was very difficult for him. That is why he decided to express his passion for horses in his paintings. The works Toulouse-Lautrec created as a child revolve almost exclusively around horses. He first taught himself how to paint, and later met his master, 
René Princeteau. Princeteau was from the same region and was himself a specialist of horse paintings, using a rather academic style. He gave Henri de Toulouse-Autrec his first painting lessons. The young boy turned to a more classical style of painting, and his technique became so good that René Princeteau pushed him to pursue his work. At this time, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was trying to pass the baccalaureate. He asked his parents' permission to move to Paris, to work at professional painting studios. These artworks depict an artillery man straddling a horse. This painting is from 1879, at which time Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was a student of René Princeteau. Note how the styles differ. Lautrec's horse was painted with short brushstrokes that give a kind of nervous feel to the silhouette, a kind of vibration. We can see that the youthful teen was also interested in the bodily movements of the artilleryman. We can see that he is ready to mount the horse. We also see how secondary the backdrop is for him, and this remains a major trait in the rest of his work. It is barely depicted, there is no background, no landscape. As early on as his adolescence, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec showed a nearly exclusive interest in animal paintings and figure paintings. He was never a landscape painter. The only landscape of Albi that he depicted in this railroad bridge that he could see from the terrace of the mansion where he was born. And that bears the name of Viaduc du Castelviel. It is a minor painting of no great significance. On the other hand, he painted his father from a photograph and in a very interesting manner. Comte Alphonse is depicted as a horse rider, of course, since it was his passion, holding an eagle with wings outstretched, for Count Alphonse was a hunter and a great falconer. Yet, the format of this work is very small. We can really sense that the young man wanted to depict the virility and the majesty of his father's stature. Through this, we can sense the admiration he had for his father, a man who cherished freedom above all, and perhaps his regret at not being able to follow in his father's footsteps. Toulouse-Lautrec's parents did not get along and they quickly separated. The Countess settled in Paris. Henri, then eight years old, remained in her custody. He went to high school and filled his notebooks with sketches and caricatures. During summer break, he would return to the south, here at the Chateau de Bosque, one of the family's residences, and took painting lessons from René Princeteau, a deaf and mute animal painter and a friend of his father's who also had a workshop in Paris. In 1881, Henri failed his baccalaureate. That is when he decided to become an artist. With his uncle and his teacher's support, he ended up persuading his mother. He then left his home and, back in Paris, took up painting lessons in various studios around the capital city. He was not yet 18. The great aristocracy was relatively nomadic. They would move from Chateau to other residences. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was born in Elby at the Hotel de Bosque. He would also stay at the Chateau de Bosque, which belonged to his father's family in the Aveyron region. He was often in Old Region, at an estate that bore the name of Céléron. That was his mother's maiden name. And from time to time, the family would also stay in Paris. When Toulouse-Lautrec interrupted his studies in 1881, he was already going to René Princeteau's studio in Paris. Following the advice of his first teacher, he began working with a more famous painter. At this time, he developed an interest in Japanese art, which undeniably influenced his work.
The Museum of Albi, where Toulouse-Lautrec's paintings are exhibited today, depicts this period in the artist's life, a time during which he had not yet fully freed himself of the conventionality he was being taught. When Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec decided to move to Paris, it was to learn a true craft, that of a painter. He first studied the atelier of Léon Bonnard, who was an official painter and a highly talented portraitist. He stayed there for only a few months. He then studied at the atelier of Comon, a historical painter who truly taught him his craft, composition and working with colour. Gourmand was a rather liberal painter and teacher. He would incite his young students to visit Parisian exhibitions, and in 1882 there was a lot to be seen. They could see the works of the Impressionists, and the young students who discovered this new genre tried it out. Even though Lautrec was not interested in landscape paintings, during his vacation time he created a few landscape paintings. These landscape paintings are seen here, depicting vineyards and riverbanks. And in his representations of the Celeron estate, which belonged to his mother's family, we see that he was attempting to play with the light coming through the leafy trees to better evoke a landscape that was merely a pretext for a pictorial exercise. But this was merely a passing exercise within the context of his training and these subjects he did not pursue. At Corman's studio, he met Vincent van Gogh, who later became his friend. The last paintings from this first phase of Toulouse-Lautrec's career are like a farewell to his past life, and they are not devoid of nostalgia. But starting in 1884, he began freeing himself from conventionality and left Corman's studio. He rented a workshop in Montmartre, which he kept for over 10 years, and settled down definitively in the heart of Paris's nightlife venue. He made the acquaintance of Edgar Degas, who had his studio in a neighboring house, and he admired him greatly. The ateliers of Bonnard and Comont were located in Montmartre. At this time, Montmartre had recently been integrated into Paris. It was still a very cheap area with low rent. There was a shady population of prostitutes and pimps, laundry women and blue-collar workers. The area saw the development of nightlife activities, like the grand balls at the Moulin Rouge. Montmartre had not yet attained its full splendor when Lautrec arrived in Paris. There was also the Moulin de la Galette, and next to the dancing halls, there are also many cabarets and café concert halls. Comment's young students roamed through this area and discovered it. Little by little, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec delved into the Montmartre nightlife, where he found subjects and models that interested him. He trouvait des sujets et des modèles qui l'intéressent. He worked during the day and every night he would enjoy the nightlife in Montmartre. He would go to the cabarets, the Ramor, the Chat Noir, the Mirliton, and the Moulin Rouge, which he immortalized. He would also frequent the Divan Japonais, the Scala and the Ambassadeurs, where a table was always reserved for him. He enjoyed the easy-going and bohemian lifestyle of late 19th century Montmartre. Thus he shattered the constraints of his aristocratic childhood. Since he frequented all sorts of people, noblemen and artists, writers and picturesque characters around Montmartre, his first paintings from this time cover a wide range of social classes. And Toulouse-Lautrec found his path in doing portraits, because he was interested in people. Among these models, two characters are pretty emblematic of the women that fascinated him. One of them is the laundry woman that he painted here in 1885. The other is Carmen the redhead that you can see on this small painting that is from the same year. 
There is a simultaneous desire to concentrate on the models and to elude the backdrop. As you can see, he barely threw on the coloured paint that constitutes the backdrop and focused all of his work on the depiction of the model who, in this case, is more authentic. He sought to bring out the psychology of his models. We can sense the toughness and the shyness of this character, and he came to often use her as a model. In 1885, Toulouse-Lautrec stopped working at Cormont's atelier. He shifted to his very own themes and subjects by committing to modernism. At first he painted some male characters, but his best portraits represent women. He preferred working from sketches, generally speaking, but many of his paintings must have been done from nature. His models were not beautiful young women, but women who were beginning to age. He did not stop drawing, and sometimes his drawings looked like caricatures. A mere few lines could bring forth a gesture or an expression. To create them, he used various media, pencil, ink, watercolor, and charcoal. For his paintings, Toulouse-Lautrec sought out artistic layouts. His use of color is sumptuous, with intense greens and reds, shading and strange artificial lights. He painted his characters using either oil paints or turpentine paints, and sometimes using strokes of clear gouache. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec painted the portrait of his first cousin, Gabriel Tapier de Celerion. The format is not meaningless, since he was a very tall man. This format is a bit like a kakemono, with this low angle view that emphasizes the high stature of his cousin Gabriel. Here, too, we can see that Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was interested in his model psychology. His shoulders droop slightly, a foot is held back. The character depicted is both a dandy and a nonchalant person. Gabriel Tapier de Celeron studied medicine in Paris. The two cousins would often go out together and had a lot of fun. About the portrait, I feel it is very developed on a chromatic level. There are flat planes of intense color. The flat red plane depicting the carpet of the Comédie Française. We are backstage of the Comédie Française, more specifically in its corridors. There is Gabriel's back clothing and the models in green, notably the woman in the background. These very strong opposite colors hint at the aesthetics of a pre fauvism painting. Of course, Toulouse-Lautrec has no students. He died very young, and he most likely did not want to teach young students. However, he did open a number of new paths in the early 20th century. In a painting such as this one, we clearly see that his chromatic approach announces the beginning of Fauvism. Like Degas, Toulouse-Lautrec gave priority to illustration. With a quick and incisive stroke, he would depict a stance, a movement. He defined and deformed the psychology of his characters. His skillful stroke was accompanied by a subtle play of colors with contrasting oranges, blues, reds, and blacks. Beyond the cabarets, he also frequented dances at the Élysée Montmartre and at the Moulin de la Galette. His paintings described the life of these cabarets and theaters, but he also painted the brothels that he frequented and where he most likely contracted syphilis. All the aspects of La Nuit Parisienne and the Belle Époque interested Lautrec. The Paris nightlife took place in cabarets, café concert halls and also in brothels. He would visit these places for personal reasons, but also as a painter. In fact, he said that there he could find natural models who did not have the frozen demeanor of studio models. Toulouse-Lautrec also frequented the Mirliton of the famed Aristide Brouin, where he exhibited his work. He took part in numerous exhibitions because he was considered from then on as the soul of Montmartre. 
he went out often and knew the leading figures of Paris. Despite his deformity, his torso was sized normally, but his legs were too short, and he had a lisp when he spoke. Toulouse-Lautrec made fun of himself, and to make up for his defects, played the part of the provocateur. He made a lot of friends this way. The painter unceaselessly studied the fast pace of dancers and circus performers, how their legs lifted and their dresses twirled. He did not leave out the ladies of the night, whom he transfigured with a strange lyricism and a touch of irony. Many of his paintings depict prostitutes. He considered them ideal models because of the spontaneity with which they moved, whether nude or half-dressed. He painted their life with curiosity, but without a trace of moralism or sentimentalism, and especially without seeking to impose on them the slightest fascinating trait. He would also go to a brothel that was located on Rue de Moulin, and there he would take notes to create artworks revolving around prostitution, a major subject within his work. This painting, titled The Salon de Moulin, is from 1894. He would make many sketches beforehand on cardboard, but would paint in his studio. For him, a major work had to have a very large format, like a historical painting, those huge artworks that can be seen in the Salon. He gave a lot of importance to two elements in this piece. Of course, his depiction of prostitutes, the women in the brothels, was entirely his own. He was like a witness recounting what he saw, but bearing no judgment. He in no way portrayed prostitution as pitiful, nor is there any voyeurism in a working such as this one, or in any of Toulouse-Lautrec's artworks, generally speaking. At times, his paintings even exhibit a certain affection for these women. Toulouse-Lautrec's interpretation was quite different from Dugas, who certainly had more of a misogynistic take. These paintings depict women waiting. They are waiting and they seem to be looking at what is happening here, on the right side. This truncated character leads us to believe that these women are waiting for a doctor's appointment, which was required in brothels. The other girls of the brothels are watching. Very few of them are looking in our direction, except for one, the one who is wearing a neck-high dress that differs from the others. This woman is clearly the head of the brothel. The others look like they are bored, worn out, and they seem a bit resigned. It's like we are behind the scenes. No clients are present in this painting. Clients are usually absent from Toulouse-Lautrec's paintings that depict brothels. Lautrec captured a daily scene here. He also represented it in a closed, circular format that communicates the sense of confinement of the place. He also insisted on heavy colours, reds and purples that contrast with the green stockings of this woman and the green of the décor. So two colours make up this work, and by their intensity, exhibit the kitsch-like luxury of the brothels. This painting was important to Lautrec, even though he created many artworks evoking the field of prostitution. 
The collection, it, the collection at Albi is perhaps one of the most complete collections on the subject. Incapable of taking part in the activities that behoove a normal body, Toulouse-Lautrec lived for his art. He depicted other milieux more stylish and upper end, and his talent for stylization opened the way for Art Nouveau. As a post-impressionist painter influenced by Japanese etchings, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was also a remarkable illustrator. He created over 300 lithographs during the 1890s, some of which have become very famous. He also created posters for his friend Jane Avril, a dancer in the French Cancan quadrille. He also illustrated 40-some songs, mostly hits played in the three greatest cabarets of the time, the Moulin Rouge, the Chat Noir, and Aristide Bruin's Mirliton. He was also a great poster maker. He truly opened the way to 20th century poster making as we know it today. Posters became a means of advertising. His first commission for posters came from the Moulin Rouge in 1891. Other posters on the Moulin Rouge had previously been made. Jules Charret created one. It exhibits smiling young women called charrettes heading to the Moulin Rouge. They are all unidentifiable and identical. Toulouse-Lautrec's signature trait was to depict true characters, the stars of the place, and they are identifiable, as we can see here on this illustration. The Goulou, the glutton, is the star of the poster. There is also a dancer, her escort, Valentin Le Désusé, and the name Moulin Rouge written three times on the poster. The electrical lighting of the room is symbolized by these yellow globes on the side of the picture. Here is a painting with flat planes of strong color that make the poster really stand out. In this day and age, we understand how to stress visibility, but back then Lautrec was one of the first to understand this. Posters had to be visible from afar, and these posters that bore Lautrec's name and were transported throughout Paris on handcarts made him famous. Immediately after this work for the Moulin Rouge, he continued working on posters for his friend, Aristide Brouillon, whom he met at his cabaret, Le Merton. Aristide Brouillon was a singer with a very special face. He also had a very strong personality. Lubtrec depicted this character by summing up Brouillon's distinctive signs and traits, his hat and scarf, his gloves and his hand atop a knotty stick. All these elements depict a strong character and a striking personality. Lautrec reconstituted these traits with flat planes of colour that give the poster its strength and power. It became so representative of Buon that within our collective memory, Buon is this image that Lautrec created. In the end, the plastic version replaced the real, the original character. His famous poster of the Moulin Rouge made him famous throughout Paris overnight. Using bold graphics, his posters created a new genre, that of advertising. Street art, the art of the here and now. He fully took part in the lifestyle of Bohemian Paris in the late 19th century. Among the three famous women that he depicted are La Goulou, Jeanne Avril, and the singer Yvette Guibert, 
with her long black gloves and her colorful language. He was also fascinated by Yvette Gilbert. She was a diseuse who spoke her song lyrics more than she sang them. She did not have a very powerful voice, but she had excellent diction, and most importantly, she had a repertoire of Montmartre songs that was often a bit bawdy. Her elegant ladylike silhouette and her long black gloves stood in contrast to her songs, whose lyrics often shocked her audience. Lutrec was enchanted by Yvette Goubert's persona and wanted to work for her. In 1894, at Yvette's request, he painted her and represented her with a very aggressive grimace. From her expression, you can imagine what she was singing, and you can understand why the Duvette, as she was called, turned down this poster. She felt it was an unflattering and ugly portrayal. That was certainly not to lose Lutrec's goal. He was anything but a caricaturist. In a painting such as this one, that bears some resemblance to Japanese art engravings, he captured the most intense expression of his model. That explains the freeze frame on Yvette Goubert's expressive grimace. Famous for her femininity, this star turned down this poster and chose a poster by Stenlin. But I think that today still, this is Toulouse-Lautrec's image, especially his work on the black glove of this diseuse, that remains etched in our memory. At the turn of the 20th century, Toulouse-Lautrec joined a literary and artistic magazine which published the works of the greatest writers and artists of the time. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was very linked to a place, the intellectual circle of the Revue Blanche, a great magazine led by the Nathan Son brothers, who created it in the last decades of the 19th century. There he met Bonnard, Vuillard, whom he already knew, and he was very close to the painters in this circle. They shared the same thoughts on art, on making art accessible to all. This is why he became interested in poster making and lithography. Poster art was certainly a means of making oneself known, but it was also an art form that could be seen by a greater number of people. He also used lithography to reach an amateur audience as well as collectioners. This approach was also used by the Nabi, and like them, he created backdrops, illustrated theatre programmes, song materials. He wanted his art to be accessible to all, without any hierarchy between the various means of exhibition. Often, when we look at the catalogues of the exhibitions in which he participated while alive, we see that his peers depicted him with Nabi painters, and they considered him as part of this avant-garde movement. An avant-garde painter, Toulouse-Lautrec was also a workaholic. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was simultaneously a painter, a lithographer and, of course, an illustrator. He created a vast collection of artworks. He died very young at the age of 37. The amount of his artwork is worth emphasizing. We may say that he devoted his life to art. To create a lithography, he had to make illustrations on stone, repeatedly, until the colour sank in. This he did himself, not for the very large formats, but for medium-sized lithographies. So he devoted an incredible amount of time to producing these artworks. He also burnt himself out by abusing alcohol, brothels, and also by working so much.
Since he was an alcoholic for the greater part of his adult life, he used to add cognac to his absinthe. At the age of 35, his health took a hard hit, and he entered a sanatorium. He was admitted to a luxurious clinic in Nui for detoxification and rehab. To prove to his doctors that he was healed, he drew a series of work on circus themes for memory. This subject matter had fascinated him even as a child, when he would come to Paris with his parents, and it stayed with him throughout his life. Given his illustrations, the doctors decided that he could be released from the clinic. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec then had two years left to live. Part of that time he spent in Bordeaux, where he drew inspiration from the effervescence of the city's cultural scene. During his last year, from 1900 to 1901, he painted works that are quite striking and that they differ from his characteristic style. He was an artist whose works was essentially based on the elongated lines, the fluidity and elegance, even the nervousness of his brushstrokes. But then his work became much more thick, heavier, more centred on dark colours. It was a different approach, a new type of painting. Dutrecht was only 37 when he died, and we cannot deny that he would have otherwise evolved as a painter. If I had to sum up Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec's artwork, I would say that he was a great portraitist, that he was really interested in human nature and in the personal reality of the characters he depicted. Beyond any social criteria, which played absolutely no part in his work, he painted people from all social groups. He painted prostitutes, singers, dancers, and of course his family members. We are lucky to have numerous portraits of the Countess de Toulouse-Lautrec, his mother, with whom he was very close. Here is one of the paintings that exemplifies this bond between mother and son. The woman's silhouette is triangular, yet truly balanced, and her stance is majestic. Avec un, un véritable équilibre et en même temps une pose euh, presque en majesté. C est, c est she was a stable figure in his life, uh, and we see the stability expressed in the bond between Lautrec and his mother. Entre, entre et elle. But at the et same time, temps, she was a sad woman. Lautrec nearly always depicted his woman, his mother, with her eyes lowered down. We also see her that way on other portraits, where the Countess is depicted in her chateau at Marrome. She had bought this chateau, located in the Bordeaux region, in order to have her very own personal residence. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was used to joining his mother every summer. When he felt himself getting weak between 1900 and 1901, he drew even closer to his mother. In 1901, he moved out to the Château de Malromé, and this is where he died. Following complications due to alcoholism and syphilis, he suffered an attack that left him paralyzed on one side. He passed away on September 9, 1901, at the age of 36, in the presence of his parents and his cousin, Gabriel Tapier de Céléron. He was buried at Verdelay, a few kilometers from the Château de Malromé, his mother's chateau near Albi. Toulouse-Lautrec is known as an extraordinary artist whose remarkable observational skills were accompanied by a deep sympathy for humanity. He never showed the slightest regret due to his deformity. He lived his short life to the fullest, made many friends, and was always accepted despite his physical shortfalls. After Toulouse-Lautrec's death, his close friend and protector, the art dealer Maurice Joyon, wanted to exhibit his works, and the Countess de Toulouse-Lautrec gave her consent. They donated the necessary funds to create a museum in Albi, the artist's native city. The museum is now the depository of the painter's works. With over a thousand artworks, the museum contains the world's greatest collection consecrated to Toulouse-Lautrec. 
The works of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec remained here in his studio after his death, and we are lucky that the Paris Museums turned down the offer to receive his works as a donation. Maurice Joyon, Toulouse-Lautrec's friend, was charged with sorting out his studio, meeting with the heads of the Paris Museums, and offering Lautrec's works as a donation. Des des Maurice Chorion's offer was turned down by the Paris Museum. Back in 1901, they did not consider Toulouse-Lautrec as an important painter. Maurice Chorion and Gabriel Tapier de Celeron, Toulouse-Lautrec's first cousin, then came up the idea of contacting the painter's native city. Since Paris did not want his artworks, they were offered to his native city, and Albi accepted this donation. The Museum of Albi thus received a vast collection of artworks. This collection is by far the largest and most varied public collection. Located within the massive 13th century fortress, the museum exhibits the works of Toulouse-Lautrec, paintings, lithographs, illustrations, and posters. It retraces the totality of his work and includes a painting by his best friend and patron, Maurice Joyon, who initiated the museum. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec met Maurice Joyon in high school. Here we have a striking portrait made in 1900, so one year prior to Lautrec's death. Here, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec depicted his friend as a hunter. We cannot help but notice the important part this person had in Lautrec's life. He was someone he could rely on throughout his life and he trusted him completely. What is interesting on a pictorial level is how Lautrec eluded the sky and sea in these yellow and green colours that are in harmony with Joyant's yellow raincoat. En harmonie avec le ciré jaune que, que porte and the hatching and shading, with colourful lines that are more or less dense. When we look at this style of painting, we see the mark of Toulouse-Lautrec's modernity. The style of this painting makes it look a bit incomplete, unfinished, contrary to the academic painting, but it also reveals the painter's gestures. We are lucky to have a chronological complete collection of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec's work, from his childhood illustrations to one of the last paintings he ever created. The collection is also thematically complete, since he was interested in various subjects. Animals, horses, portraits, brothels and ca cabarets are depicted in paintings, lithographies, posters and illustrations. There is a second collection in France, which is exceptional by the number of works it includes and their quality. It is a collection of lithographies and posters preserved at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. There's also a collection of high-quality paintings at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. We know that all the great works from 1885 to 1890 are abroad, including Lautrec's first forays into modernism, depicting great bowls at the Moulin Rouge. These paintings are in the United States, mostly in Chicago, at the Met in New York City and in Washington, D.C. Other paintings are found in a number of European collections, and even in Japan, since, over the past few years, Japanese museums have made remarkable acquisitions, mainly lithographies and posters. The Toulouse-Lautrec Museum at Albi has paired up with a museum in Tokyo that holds an exceptional collection of lithographies.
Despite his short life and illnesses, the painter's corpus is as vast as it is talented. The catalog of his works numbers 737 paintings and 275 watercolors. He is also one of the fathers of the modern poster, with 369 lithographs and around 5,000 illustrations. A talented portraitist, his characters express great psychological depth. In 2009, at Christie's in London, a painting by Toulouse-Lautrec was sold for $9 million.